All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm glad you're here with me to geek out on uh, scientific and philosophic ideas for freedom and flourishing. Um, we're, we're an odd bunch, if you think about it. There aren't a whole lot of people who gather uh, for a few days to talk about deep philosophic ideas and their relationship to these two master important values in human life, flourishing, the, the end that we're all trying to, to achieve, the thing we want out of life, and freedom, the, the, the political condition that's necessary for us to be able to act on our judgment and achieve that thing. And so um, I, I, I'm, you're my kind of people uh, to, to be here. So I want to give you guys a big congratulations on just taking life seriously, because that's what this means. This, th that's what this is all about, It's taking life seriously. We, we live once, and um, we're either going to do it the best we can or something less than that. And if you want to do it the best you can, and live the most beautiful life possible to you, you've got to take it seriously. You've got to take these ideas seriously, and that's what we're here to do. And um, it's, you know, that we're, that we're, you're in the smallest percentile uh, in the world of people who actually think this way and go this deep, so I congratulate you on that. Um, being in New England again, I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, and, um, and so I'm a New England guy to begin with. Um, but being back here, I've been reminiscing about my uh, childhood stomping ground, which is just north of here in New Hampshire and Maine, in the mountains of New Hampshire and Maine. Um, I went to a summer camp, a boys' summer camp, uh, on Lake Winnipesaukee, which you're looking at here on, on the screen. Uh, and the summer camp was called Camp Cabian, still, still running. It's a wonderful, wonderful camp. Um, the camp is all about choice. You go to their homepage, kbn.com or kbn.org, whatever it is, and the first thing you see there is, I chose it, I loved it, I did it, or something like that. But I chose it as the first thing there. And the reason that's there is because the whole MO of the camp is that you should be self-guided. You should choose the things that you want to do in life. So you get to choose your activities every day, and you don't have to do activities that you don't want to do. That's my kind of camp right there. I'm one of the, I don't want to do stuff I don't have to do. I don't like being bossed around, right? So it was just a wonderful place for me. And um, it's, a, it's a camp that has all sorts of things that you can do, from archery to, uh, to hiking to acting classes to um, you know, tennis, sailing, you name it. It's just a whole, whole plethora of things that you have an option to, to get into. And among the many things, the almost countless things that you can do, I did exclusively, or almost exclusively, one thing, and that was I went mountain climbing. I fell in love with the mountains in New Hampshire and Maine. Um, uh, and I joined at KB, and I joined the Cabian Mountain Club, which was a sort of an exclusive club for people who really took hiking seriously, hiking and climbing seriously. And we would trek around the various ranges, the Presidential Range, the Franconia Range, the Mahusics. There are all these different ranges within the White Mountains and the other mountains in New Hampshire and Maine, and they're just, just beautiful. This is the, uh, this is, these are the members of the KMC, or at least uh, many of them. Uh, that's me in the front on the left, believe it or not, with the long hair. <laughs> we, were, we were hippies, all of us. I'm still a hippie. Um, I just, I just keep my hair short because I have to get up and speak. Um, believe it or not, the guy peering over in the very, very back on the far left is David Hyde Pierce, the actor, uh, famous for his role in Frasier and, and other things. He was, a, he was a counselor at the camp, and in addition to hiking, he was in the KMC. But in addition to that, he taught acting there. And it was just, it was just a supremely wonderful camp. But for me, the whole thing was hiking and climbing in these mountains in, uh, in New Hampshire. A typical trip would be we'd pile into this van from, from headquarters, from back at the camp, and we'd head out. and We'd stop for provisions. We'd stop at a store to pick up any, any extra food we need. We'd buy spam and sardines. We ate spam. You young, you young people don't know this, but spam is not just the, the bad email that comes in. It's also a canned meat. <laughs> That is, nobody knows what's in it. I don't even think the people who make it know what's in it. And we would make, I kid you not, we would make sweet and sour Spam for, for breakfast. Here's how you make sweet and sour, sour Spam. Just a quick aside. You fry the Spam in, in one pan until it's just tender. 
And then in another pan, you stir together chili sauce, which is like spicy um, ketchup, and tang. I kid you not, tang. You throw some tang in there and stir it up, and that's your sauce, and you dump it on the spam, and there's your sweet and sour spam. And we literally, we ate this stuff on, on these camping trips. Um, so anyway, we'd get to the mountains, and we'd get to the, the, the base of a range, and we'd charge into the woods, and we'd go elevate our bodies and souls. We'd take off into this. This is Mount Lafayette, uh, which is uh, part of the Franconia Range. And that was one of my favorite ranges. You'll see some more of that in a minute. Uh, but as you can see, much of the hiking is above tree line. And it, it's just breathtakingly beautiful, this, this area. It's hard to believe that it's just right up the street, in effect. Um, but this was my stomping ground. This is where I went and played. And this uh, Mount Lafayette is one of my favorite climbs. This is the Franconia uh, Ridge, the same mountain range. But you can see where the trail is just going over these ridges. This, this particular mountain range is interesting because of the ridges connect the various mountains. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, you're viewing it from Mount Lincoln. The two peaks over there in the distance are Mount Flume and Mount Liberty. This is the Mahusic Notch. This is the Mahusic Range bridges from New Hampshire into Maine. And it's the Mahusic Notch, which is this, this you know, big crevice in the middle of it all, is known as the hardest mile of the Appalachian Trail. And the reason it's the hardest mile is because it goes for a mile and you have to go over and under all these boulders. And it's, it's just a real adventure. And down in the caves of these boulders, even in the middle of July and August, there's ice because it's so hidden from, from light and the elements that would melt it. Another shot from Mahusik uh, Notch. Um, so this place was just an absolute adventure for me. And I, I was there from about 11 years old to about 14, three summers in a row, and I would, I would go two months each summer into the woods, and this was my life. And the adventures were topped off with a trip to one of the many water uh, or swimming holes that pepper New Hampshire and Maine. Uh, they're all over the place. My favorite was Franconia Falls, and uh, this place is just stunning. The waterfall coming down on the left is a water slide. You go up, you can see the water as it wraps around a little bit at the top. You, you, you sit your butt down up there, and as soon as you let go of that rock, that thing just shoots you down, and you go flying off that ledge into that deep pool of water. And then, no matter what your MO is about cussing, you cuss words you never knew you could say because that water is so cold that it feels like pins are sticking in you. Now, it's fun enough that the pain is worth it, but, but it, is, it is painful, I'm gonna tell you right now. We went back there uh, when my daughter was a, a, about nine or 10, and she went down that thing, and I, I think she cussed. I don't think she knew cuss words yet, and she was cussing. Anyway, th this, this is how we ended our trips, with this just wonderful playground out in, in the wilderness. For me, this was the most memorable, first of all, it was my favorite aspect of childhood, what, what was this time in these mountains with the KMC. And it's my, one of my favorite memories in my life. And I wanna talk about why. What, what is it about an experience like this that makes it so special? You, you probably have memories in your life of some aspect of your life that was just like, this is, we're living, we're living fully, like, or I'm living fully, this is, this is me, this is me being the, the person that I wanna be, the person that, you know, loving life to the fullest. And that's what this was for me, and I'm sure you all can think about it, and I have other instances in life, but this one really stands out for me. And I think what's going on in these kinds of instances is that we're finding ourselves living and pursuing values fully in harmony with our natures as human beings. This is us pursuing our goals and engaging in activities fully in harmony with our natures as human beings, the kind of animals that we are. And I wanna talk about that uh, at some length and fold in some other examples. And, um, and I've got a sort of a thesis or a hypothesis on this and, and uh, a strategy that I've worked out that I think is interesting. It's still a work 
in progress, but I think you'll find it uh, somewhat interesting. So this is what we're going to talk about today. This is, a, this is a causal chain that I think you'll find interesting once we start talking about the various stages of it. Um, and there's no need to read it through now because we're going to take it one step at a time and we're going to cover it. So I don't, don't try to multitask here. Just bear with me. I think you'll find this interesting. <clears throat> what, is, what is this thing we call life? What is this thing we call life? It's, it's a big project. We live for decades. We have all sorts of complexities. We are, uh, in fact, I'm going to go back because I don't want you guys reading that while I'm saying these last few words. <laughs> Stole it. I took it back. Um, <clears throat> life is complex. If, if you think about it, take any complex aspect of life, some really complex aspect of life, getting an education all the steps involved in that, figuring out where to go, what to take, this, that, and the other. Deciding on a career. How big is that decision? It's a massive decision. You're going to be doing this for decades. You've got to figure out what's this thing you're willing to put you know, many hours a day into on a regular basis. That's a big decision. Think about uh, some, a, a surgeon performing heart surgery or, or, a, or a kidney transplant and the complexity of that. The complexity of someone writing a novel or the complexity of starting a business a startup for you crazy people who do that crazy thing. All of these things are extremely complex, extremely complex, yet they're just one thing in the overarching massively complex thing we call living and trying to love life, right? L trying to flourish. Flourishing is, extreme, is so much more complex than any one of these elements of flourishing and people lose sight of this, like, oh, achieving happy is, happiness is easy. No, it is not. To make the most of your life, to fill your life with joy, to actually engage fully as, as the kind of being that you are so that your life is the very best it can be is a huge, complex process. And it's no surprise, then, that there's a whole industry dedicated to trying to deal with all of this complexity. It's called the self-development industry, the self-help industry, right? This whole industry exists with people trying to, and some of it's really, really good, right? You, you, I'm at, oh, Cal Newport is speaking at this conference uh, on, on Saturday, and you think of James Clear and Greg McEwen and David Allen and the various great thinkers, Stephen Covey going back there, all the way back to Benjamin Franklin, right? There's this self-development genre, and it's really important. And no doubt you guys study it, right? And you probably study it for the same reason I do. I want to flourish. And here's people talking about how we can do that thing that's so damn hard to do. So we, we have this industry. And within the industry, there's a lot of disagreement and a lot of complexity about the, the, the question of how to solve this problem or how to achieve this goal. There's focus on goals. There was a whole goal setting movement for, for many years. Ed Locke, uh, who some of you may be familiar with, started that movement. Today, there's a whole movement that says, forget about goals, focus on systems. All right, this is James Clear and a few other thinkers' whole approach. Then there's be a generalist. No, be a specialist. Uh, say yes to every opportunity you have for growth. No, says Greg McEwen, say no to practically everything. Almost everything you might say yes to is trivial and not important, right? So you get these, these different ideas on this. And how can we make them, how can we figure out within this big, and they, these guys all have good arguments for their positions, by the way. They, 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 they contradict each other and you say, wow, I'm siding with this guy. Go read the opposing guy and see what, see what you think. They're, these are bright people with really good ideas and arguments about their positions, but, but they don't all mesh. And so my, my theory here and, and the strategy I want to talk to you about is I think one of the things it can help us do is to figure out for ourselves, given our own personal contexts, what aspects of self-development theory are good for us, given our personal context and given our natures. And that's what I want to talk about now. So we'll come back and I'll give this back to you. So I want to start here at the top. Your life is a process of self-sustaining, self-generated action. This is what life is. It's, it's what life is for all things, not just human beings. So a plant 
engages in a process of self-generated, self-sustaining action called photosynthesis, right? The plants go for sunlight and they reach their roots into the ground for nutrients and water and whatnot. And animals, uh, simpler animals than us, do the same kind of thing. Nest building is a process and hunting is a process, right? An eagle flying over is engaged in a process of looking for rabbits or whatever he's trying to eat and so forth. So life is a process of self-generated, self-sustaining action. This is just a fact, raw fact. And what we're going to see is all of these things are just raw facts, and they add up to something, I think, interesting. To live, you must act. This, too, is true of everything. Action is the essence of life. Life is a process of action. That's what it is, right? If, if a thing stops acting totally, if a living thing stops acting totally, I meaning its heart stops, the breathing stops, everything stops, what's that called? Death, right? You're, you're toast. That's the end of it. Life is action. To live, you must act. Again, just a fact. To act, as a human being at least, you must choose your actions. We, we have the power of choice. And I, I know some people dispute this, and you might be thinking, oh, but Sam Harris says we don't. Well, we'll talk about that as we go. To choose your actions, you must choose to think. And the, one of the brilliant points that Ayn Rand made is that the locus of free will really is right there. It's in the choice to think or not to think. And the alternative, and this is where you can introspect and see that you have free will. The alternatives that we have are to decide to think and figure out what's true in reality ourselves, what makes sense and what's good for our lives, or to default to a few possible alternatives. One alternative is to just not, if you choose not to think, you default basically to going by emotion, which you can do. It's a thing you can do, but it's not good for you because your emotions don't tell you what's true and what's good for you, and they don't project into the future. They don't do, that's what thinking is about. So you can do that, but it doesn't work for you, and that's why when people just act on their emotions, their lives turn into a mess. The other thing you can default to is to other people's opinions or their dictates, right? And that's not good for you either because other people may be wrong, and most of the time they are, so you really don't want to do that, right? So thinking is essential to acting in a way that's good for your life. And we have that choice. We have the choice to think, to focus our mind, and do this thing or not. And that's really all that free will is. It's a very small thing, but it has very big consequences, right? So those are alternatives there. To maximize our happiness, not just to get by in life and live a mediocre life, but to, to do the very best that we can in life, we have to do a few things. The first thing that we have to do is we have to choose and prioritize the values and goals that will serve that purpose for us. And this is very individual. Like, what do, what do you want to do for a career? You're going to spend a lot of time in this career, so you've got to make a choice about that. You've got to choose a career that will serve that purpose. If you choose a career that's just mediocre and mundane and not fun, then you'll live that kind of life. It's a choice. You can do it, but it's not good for you. It's not, it's not going to help you to flourish. So this is a really big deal that we have to do this thing. We've got to choose and prioritize these, these uh, values. And Ayn Rand famously called this hierarchizing your values, getting your values in order of their relative importance. So you know, if you think about it, you actually can't make value decisions. You can't make sound value decisions if you don't have your values in, in order of importance. How would you know whether you should go to the movies tonight or stay home and read this book? All right, if it's just out of, if it's just between those two things, which one should I do? And you don't have any hierarchy of value, you have no idea which one you could do. The only way you can make a decision if the decision is supposed to be which good for your life, is you've made a decision about these things. Do you need to read this book because there's a report you have to write on it tomorrow? Or have you done your work and it's time to go out and play and that's the thing your life needs today, right? So you have to have value hierarchies and you have to know the relationship of values to this goal of flourishing. You and if you don't have that, you can't, you can't think in a value appropriate way. Once you have your values hierarchized, you've got them in some kind of order, you have to pursue them with respect to that order of importance. If you just organize them in your head or on paper, but then don't pursue them with respect to their order of importance, then there was no point in organizing them to begin with, right? The action is what matters. So this is where you want to, be in, you want to have integrity. 
This is where, where integrity comes in. You have integrity to your values. That's a really important thing in life. And the opposite or the flip side of this same point is don't surrender a greater value for the sake of a lesser value. Don't give up things that are more important for your life for things that are less important for your life. This is what Ayn Rand, this is how Ayn Rand defines sacrifice. And I think it's precisely correct if you think about the logic of it. If you're giving up something more important for the sake of something less important to your life, that's a sacrifice. It's a big loss, right, to do that. Uh, some people misuse that the term sacrifice to just mean any any kind of trade, but I think it really does mean not having integrity to your values, not doing the thing that you know you should do. And to do that, to pursue your values with respect to their relevant importance. You have to develop viable plans and systems that work toward that end. Life is complex again, right? You, it's not just, oh, I've got my values in order, now I will go out and do it without any additional data, right? This is why whole systems are developed in the self-development industry, getting things done. David Allen's whole system. How do, you, how do you get things done, right? You've got, here's a whole system on how to do it. You know, capture things, sort them in a certain way, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then there's James Clear's system for developing good habits and breaking bad habits, right? A whole system to do this thing. And you need these kinds of things because it's just not going to happen automatically and life is complex. And then you've got uh, Greg McEwen's system where he says it's not just about getting things done, it's about getting the right things done, which of course was uh, Stephen Covey's point as well. So, but you see how there's a whole, there's a whole important another aspect here that builds on top of the others. And then to make all of this count, all of this thinking and planning count, you have to engage in the corresponding process of action that's authorized by this, is warranted by this, right? And if you don't do that, then all of this is for naught because thinking is important, but action is pivotal. If you don't take the actions necessary to actually flourish, you're not going to flourish. So, right? Notice that all of these are facts. You, you, know, you can't look at any of these and go, well, I'm going to dis dispute that point. These are simple facts in a sense. There are, and, and there's this causal chain here of connections to what life is. Now, I want to run back through this list quickly and point out the relationships of these ideas to the various fields of human knowledge, because I think there's a big integration here that you'll find interesting and helpful. Your life is a process of self-sustaining, self-generated action. This is obviously a biological point. That's the definition of life, or arguably the definition of life. I think there's some disputes about how properly to define life. But it's certainly true that, that, that is a that, that's, an, that's a fact about life, either way. It's also a metaphysical fact. It's just about the nature. It's just the way the world is. Living things are processes of self-generated, self-sustaining. That's what they are. So that's just a metaphysical fact, philosophically speaking. Metaphysics is the, the branch of philosophy that studies the basic nature of reality, including the nature of things in reality. So you know what, what a human being is, the, the, the metaphysical essence of a human being is that we have to act in certain ways and, and, and the like. Um, to live, you must act. Stillness is death. Again, this is a metaphysical fact, a biological fact. Take it either way. But it's fundamental. These are really fundamental ideas. Uh, to choose your actions, you must choose to think as a human being. This is true. We, 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 again, you can introspect. You can either choose to think and activate your own mind to say, hey, I want to figure out what's true. I want to figure out what's good. I'm going I'm to look at reality and focus on that. Or you can default to the alternatives, either going by emotions or going by other people's opinions. And this is not only a metaphysical fact, but we're now starting to get into some other aspects of philosophy, this is also an epistemological, has an epistemological element. Why is it that you have to think to figure it out? Because thinking is your means of knowledge. You, your use of your reasoning mind is your means of knowledge. So this, now we're getting into, me, into epistemology, which is the branch of philosophy that studies how we acquire and validate knowledge. And that's what, that, that's, that's why thinking is so important. Emotions are important in life, but they're not our means of knowledge. So we got to think. Other people are important in life, but they're not our means of knowledge. We've got to think. To maximize your happiness, uh, you must choose and prioritize your values and goals for that purpose. Well, now we're getting into, this is still metaphysically factual. This is still a fact. It's just a bare fact. But now we're getting into the realm of ethics. 
how to deal with values and what values are. Values are the things you, you act to gain and keep in order to make your, your life great. They're the goals you go after, your relationships, your career, your recreational activities, food, clothing, shelter, all of the stuff that you go after, liberty, freedom, right? Those are the things that are, that are values and you, you, you need those to live. Um, and you've got to maximize these and prioritize them, and that's, that's a huge aspect of the, the uh, branch called ethics. All right, so now we're getting into, in, further into ethics. Uh, Ayn Rand talked about hierarchizing your values and then living in accordance with that hierarchy and not committing sacrifices. This is like the math, I like to call it the math of egoism or the math of ethics. You take it, values as a scientific uh, uh, topic, scientific subject. Once you understand that the purpose of values is to, is, to, is to keep you alive and enable you to flourish, then you can make a science out of this thing, which is precisely what Rand, uh, Rand did. Uh, you must then uh, pursue them with respect to that hierarchy. So this is the action aspect of ethics. Yeah, you've got to take this stuff seriously. Have integrity. Don't sacrifice, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So now we're into ethics. Uh, proper, and you see we've gone from epistemology and biology and all of that into, into um, uh, human nature, choice, into epistemology, you've got to think, and now into ethics, and now we get to, and to do that, you must develop viable plans and systems that work. Hmm. All of a sudden, we're in self-development. That's, the, that's, the whole, that's half the self-development industry right there is figuring out the systems. The other half of the self-development industry is figuring out how to act on the systems that you've chosen so that you can do it. So the systems I already mentioned, getting things done, uh, you know, atomic habits, these kinds of books that focus on that. The ones that focus or the, the aspects that focus on taking the actions that you need, think of James Clear's advice, if, if you know anything about his work, that you need to create environments that incentivize the behaviors that you want, right? How do you do that? Well. If you, if you don't want to eat carbs, you're trying to lose weight, so you want to cut carbs out of your diet, don't bring them into your house. You change the environment in your house. Now you can't eat carbs because they're not there. If you want to learn to play the guitar, instead of leaving it in the closet, you put it out in the middle of your living room between you and the television set. So every time you sit down thinking you're going to watch TV, it's like, no, I think I'll play guitar instead. Right? You change your environment. If you want to work out and you're not working out, sign up for a gym that's on the way home from work or build a gym in your garage right, or, 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 or wherever you can. Figure out a way to do the thing that you need to do. And that's another aspect. Uh, Mel, Mel Robbins has a book called The Five Second Rule. And the whole point of the book is to figure out how to get you to do the thing you know you need to do because so, so, so many of us don't do that. We know what we need to do to make our lives great, but we can't get ourselves to take that action. She calls this the knowledge action gap, and I think it's a real thing. How many of you know exactly what you need to do to lose weight but don't do it? Or how many of you know exactly what you need to do to you know, get this project on, on the way? So the whole procrastination thing is, is the knowledge action gap, right? So those last two elements there are all about the self-development industry. That's what they're after. But look at this big integration. This isn't, a, this isn't two different fields. It's one big integrated thing. It's, it's philosophy, epistemology, metaphysics, ethics, self-development, and it's, a, it's one big system, all of which matters, and all of which is interconnected. It's one big integration. And this is what I think we need to see life as, because this is what life is. <laughs> it's not really, it's not like, well, here's one way to look at it. This, I think, I think argue, and I'm open to persuasion on this, but I think this is just what life is. It's true that all of these things are the case. And I'll talk, I'll, I'll link it back briefly now to, uh, to my time at Cabian. When I was a kid at Cabian, I didn't have any of this in my mind. I didn't know any of this stuff. But I was doing essentially this. I was living a life I loved by choosing the values I wanted to do, taking them seriously, and going after them and doing the action thing. I was living a life that I loved in harmony with my nature. That's what it is to live fully, is to figure out what your nature is. We are a certain kind of being. We have free will. We have reason. We have emotions. All of these things have a role in our lives. And if we figure out their proper roles and then fold them in with the self-development stuff that connects to them, we can think much more clearly about which self-development things are proper for me, which, which things work for me, 
which things don't. And that's, I think, one of the values of this integration. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But I want to hit on a couple of other values, and I've got to take a look at my notes here to make sure I'm not getting too far astray. So one thing that this helps us to do is simply to better understand the relationship of loving life, of flourishing, this thing, with the fundamental truths on which that goal depends. If you don't do these things that you must do according to the law of causality, according to the reality that we live in, then you can't have the thing that you want because they, it's, it's a causal relationship. If you want X, then you've got to enact the causes to get that thing. And so that's one thing. This can help us to just bear in mind that there, there's a, a big relationship between the law of causality, the way that things are in this world, the kind of animal that we are, and the thing that we want, this flourishing. Another thing it can do is it can help us be more accepting of the complexity of life because we can see it kind of in a big picture and it can also help us to navigate it a little bit better because if you're ever finding yourself not doing something that you kind of know you should be doing or you're finding yourself stumbling with something, you can go down this kind of list. To live, you must act. Am I just sitting around? Am I, is it that bad? I'm just not taking any action at all. I'm just being a couch potato. Get your ass off the sofa, if that's the case, right? There's a very simple, simple idea there. But it gets a little more complex as you go. Am, am I failing to choose my actions? Am I failing to think for myself and decide what I want to do? Am I letting myself be driven by either my emotions? Am I just sort of going with my emotional flow? Or am I letting other people dictate? what I should be doing? Have I turned my life over to others? Have I become a puppet, right? That's not good for your life. So you can ask yourself, what, what is the thing that I'm doing that's causing me a problem? Is it that? Is it, is it the lack of thought? Is it perhaps that um, I have, I'm failing to prioritize my values? Is that what the problem is? I need to prioritize my values. Have I got conflicting values and I just don't know which one's more important? Then you know what you need to work on if that's the case. So it, it's a helpful map for thinking about where your problems are, are coming from. Uh, am I, have I organized my values? I know exactly what I need to do, but I'm not doing it? Or I'm violating that hierarchy? I'm committing sacrifices in some way? I'm not having integrity? If that's the problem, okay, good. Now I know where the problem is. I know how I can deal with that. Uh, have I not developed the... Uh, Oh yeah, I already did that one. Have I not developed the, the systems that are necessary to enact that? Maybe I'm trying to take those actions, but I simply don't have the systems. Then you can work on that. Maybe read, read some James Clear, read some, read some, read some of the self-development thinkers who have a lot to say about it. These guys and gals who write these self-development books, not all of them, but a lot of them, they are wicked smart. I don't know if you've heard Cal Newport speak, but you'll hear him on Saturday. These people are over the top intelligent, and they have done deep dives on systems that actually work and figuring out how the human mind works and, and you know, what things you can do to, to make your, you know, to really level up in your life. And if you, if you can think in this holistic way and then use their stuff to improve your life, you get much more power out of it. So you can do that with it. And then, you know, at the end, to make it all count, are you, have you done all of that other stuff, but you're, not, you're just not throwing the switch? You're not taking the action, right? So that's another thing that I think you can get some help out of this. You can you see, see life as a holistic thing, and you can also um, navigate better and see where you might be having problems in your life. And lastly, and I already sort of made this point, but I'll put the emphasis on it here, if you think about it all this way, and you see how the philosophy and the, the epistemology and the metaphysics and the ethics and the self-development all sort of work together, then when you get to reviewing self-development work and you see conflicting things, you know, focus on goals, no, focus on systems. Well, in your own life, where are your weaknesses? I mean, maybe you haven't set goals and that's the reason you can't even get to setting systems. Goals set your direction, you gotta have some goals. You can't literally forget goals, and James Clear doesn't mean that when he says forget goals. He's just trying to, it's sort of an attention grabber. He knows you need goals, but you can, as he puts it, you can have, or I'll, I'll use one of his uh, direct quotes. He says, uh, we don't rise to the level of our, of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. And this is true because you can set any goal you want, but if you don't have a system to get there, it doesn't matter if you set the goal. 
you don't just automatically get to this big goal you set. Your system is the thing that gets you there. And wherever your system is, that's where you're going to fall to. There's no question about that. So the goals are important. The systems are important. But if you see all of this holistically and you approach the self-development literature and their thinking in a way that is, that is um, specific to your needs in your context, I think you can cherry pick from it more powerfully and figure out how to use this stuff uh, better. I want to talk about some of the tools that I use. Um, and this will give you an idea of how this works, at least for me. So um, I've, you know, I'm a slow reader, so I've read a, a gazillion self-development books, but I'm fascinated by this topic. Um, I'm fa and I'm really fascinated by the integration of self-development and philosophy. So I do a lot of reading in this area. And some of the books that I've read in the past several years that have been really, really impactful on me are uh, Greg McEwen's book, Essentialism, which I just adore, really, really wonderful book. And just one of the, one of the sort of tactics from his book, and these books contain strategies, big, broad principles, and then they contain tactics. And one of the tactics from his book, he calls the 90% rule, and it's just this. When you're trying to decide whether to take on a project or, or some relationship or whatever, you ask yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, is this a 9 or a 10? And if it's not, then it's a 0. Done. What's the value of this? You only do good stuff in life. <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful tool for just getting the, the mediocre, mundane stuff out of your life. Some relationship, you're like, oh, I'm not getting that much out of this relationship. It is a nine or a 10. No, it's a seven. Then it's a zero. It's not, it's not a seven. It's a zero, right? And it's just a clean cut way to take life, take your values seriously. So that's one tool that I use. Uh, from Dan Sullivan, one of my favorite uh, thinkers in the world, he's got this idea that he calls the gap and the gain. The gap and the gain. And here um, he, he talks about the fact that you know, all ambitious people, and I think that's everybody here, you've got all these ideals out there, these goals you're going after, right? And there's always this big gap between where you are and that big ideal out there, right? And sometimes it can feel like, damn it, I'm not getting anywhere. I just keep moving forward, but the gap keeps moving with me, and I never get to the thing that I'm trying to do. And he says, those, you know, having those ideals and having those big goals, that's really important in life. But you have got to pause and look back at the gain. You've got to see, you've got to look back and see what you've done. Oh my, you look back for the next, the past month or the past years, like, holy smoke, I've done a whole lot. I've been kicking ass. I'm rocking. This is awesome, right? And this is really important for a lot of reasons. It's important psychologically for self esteem. Where does your self esteem come from? It comes from demonstrating to yourself that you can get stuff done that's good for your life and you're capable of dealing with reality and living well, and that you're worthy of all of this, right? That's where you get it from. You have to pay attention to your successes in life. At OSI, we have Friday meetings. Every Friday, we talk about wins for the week. Talk, we get it, remember the good things that you've done, because hardworking people can get lost in the, everything's forward, everything's forward. No, you gotta look back. So it's also helpful for motivation, right? You, you know, you look back at these hard things, like, wow, I did all that hard stuff, and then you look forward at these hard goals, and you're like, I can do this stuff. Right? That's, it, it's really important to do that. So that's another big value that I think um, that, that I get. And I know now because of this kind of thinking, I, I can see, oh, I'm not looking back enough. That's, that's the problem. I'm feeling stifled. I'm like, oh my God, can I do all of this stuff ahead of me? Where, where's my problem here? Oh, the gap and the gain. There's my problem. So this is a tool that I have found useful. You might not. You might not have that particular problem. But if you do, and if you're cherry picking from the, the self-development materials, uh, that can be helpful. Uh, James Clear, I've already talked about create the environments that incentivize the behavior you want. I won't repeat that because I already mentioned it, but that's a tool that I use. We, you know, we wanted to get carbs out of our diet, so we stopped buying carbs. We want to increase, we want to improve the way that we're working out, so we're building a gym in our garage, and, and so on. Cal Newport. Cal Newport talks all about the importance of deep work and the fact that you cannot multitask. You think you can multitask, you're wrong. You just can't, the, the mind does not work that way. All these people who think, ah, I'm multitasking. No, you're not. You're, you're doing two things poorly. Um, and so the, you can't do that. And 
Um, and then he talks a lot about being really intentional with social media and, and digital stuff because it can just suck the life and time out of your life. I mean, you, you, the energy and time out of your life, which is your life, right? You don't want to do that. You don't want to go down the rabbit hole of just bopping around on Twitter and thinking that the world is coming to an end when, in fact, it's getting better every day, right? And this is bad, bad for you. So he, Cal Newport's whole system for, and he's still working on it. He's trying to get people, he's trying to get us all out of the email hell that we're all in. Who's in email hell? Cal Newport is, is, is the hero who's trying to solve that problem. And he'll, he'll be talking about that. I'm in, I'm in the middle of his new book, A World Without Email, um, which is really good. Uh, and then lastly, just another one, you know, David Allen. Uh, David Allen's system, getting things done. The most important aspect of that for me was simply the business of, hey, you, your, your mind is for having ideas, not for holding them. You can't, you, you've got to get all of your ideas out of your head into a trusted system so that you free your mind to think rather than to worry about, am I remembering the stuff I'm supposed to do, right? Really important tool for me. Now, again, the whole point of this is not that there's one self-development way that you should go. The whole point is that, that those things are actually not metaphysically necessary for you. It depends on your context. They're really contextual. The other aspects of this are just sheer facts. It's universally true that life is a, is a process of self-sustaining, self-generated action. All of these other points are universally true until we get to, um, well, actually, even, even the last two are universally true in the sense that you have to do these things, but the particular tools that you use for those purposes are very much uh, a matter of personal choice, just like your choice of your career is a matter of personal choice. You, know, you can do anything you want as long as it's not robbing banks or you know, defrauding people or whatever. So anyway, this is what I call, this, this system is what I call doing process, the, the system itself. If you're doing this thing, if you're paying attention to this integration of ideas, you're doing process. And the standing order for myself, the sort of reminder that I've developed in my own mind to sort of get myself back on track if I find myself going down some YouTube rabbit hole that's not really a good use of my time, is I just tell myself, hey, do process. Get back on, get, get back on the, the program here. Do process. And that's what this means for me. And that's why I titled this talk, uh, Do Process, A Strategy for Thriving. Now, this is definitely still uh, a work in progress. I don't have, um, I haven't made my final conclusions on all of this. And I think there's a whole lot more to be done in this area. I urge you to do it. Anybody who's got interest in this area, the integration of philosophy, particularly deep fundamental philosophy and ethics with self-development and productivity and all of those things. It's a huge field that has been almost entirely ignored. There's been this big bifurcation that philosophy is about, you know, it's pie in the sky BS. And then there's this trying to make your life great. And the fact is, they should have been integrated all along. And they've, I, we can talk about the reasons in the Q&A if you want to talk about why they haven't been. I have some thoughts on that, but I want to wrap up here. So I want to return to my days at Cabian and in the mountains of, of New Hampshire. And we'll go back to a pretty picture for that. <clears throat> Again, in my childhood at KB, and I did not have any of this explicitly in my mind. I was a kid. I was 11 years old, 12 years old, somewhere in there. And uh, I was just running through the mountains having a blast. But although I didn't have any of this explicitly in mind, all of this was happening implicitly. That's why I was loving what I was doing. I was choosing my activities. I was engaging in them because they were chosen, because I chose them because they were things I loved to do. There was no extraneous noise on these trips. It was just one big integrated thing. I didn't, we didn't let the noise in. There were, there were no alarm clocks. There were no televisions. There were no phones. There were just birds and brooks and wind, right? That's where we were. We had a fully integrated process underway a fully integrated process of living in harmony with our nature, the kind of beings that we are. That's why this memory is so powerful for me. That's why this time was so important for me. And I'm trying to live that way now. But in adult life, it's a whole lot more difficult, right? As adults, 
we don't just have to organize getting the spam and the, and the sweet and sour sauce worked up, right? Adult life is really, really complex. But that's all the more reason we need to be systematic about it. The more complex it is, the more you need the systems and the principles to navigate that. So to live with the kinds of feelings, the kind of love of life and the kind of enthusiasm for life that I had in these mountains, to do that as an adult with the full breadth and depth of our adult context, it's really helpful to see this kind of integration, to take it seriously, and to spend some time thinking about these things. And that's why I find due process helpful, and I hope you find it helpful too. Thank you. All right, I think we have um, a little over 15 minutes for questions. I can't see very well. Hi, Ellen. So I'd love to hear your, what your thoughts are on philosophy and self-development. You said to have someone ask during the question period. Oh, about why they've been bifurcated. Um, and yeah. how in your thoughts on connecting them. I know you've given. Yeah. This is a wonderful talk, by the way. Thank you very much. That's a great question, and I'm <laughs> glad you asked it. Um, so yeah, I, why, why is it that philosophy, fundamental philosophic ideas, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, these really important aspects of life, at least if you see them this way, why have they been kept away from these last two things, how to, how to develop systems and how to act in a way that makes your life great? And the reason is because philosophy for, uh, frankly, since, uh, since Aristotle <laughs> has gone in the wrong direction, since after Aristotle, right? Aristotle held that philosophy is love of wisdom, and he held that ethics and the purpose of ethics is to flourish, is to achieve eudaimonia, right? That was the whole, that's what morality is all about, living a wonderful life, the thing we're talking about here. But after uh, Christianity took over, well, first of all, Plato's ideas became uh, dominant in, among what are called the Neoplatonists, and they had different ideas about what it meant to act well. It wasn't acting on your own judgment. It was going by what the philosopher kings knew, and they have better, your mind doesn't work so well, but their minds work really well, so you gotta do what they think. And then we get Christianity after that, which is just sort of Platonism, the idea that there's a, 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 a second dimension where real reality is, right? That folds into Christianity, where there's a second dimension where God is, and that's the really important reality, right? And then we get with that the ethics of sacrifice, right? Jesus on the cross, that's the ultimate, uh, that's the ultimate sign of, of moral virtue. He sacrificed himself for all of our alleged sins, right? Then morality in particular within philosophy starts to become all about not pursuing values, as Aristotle would have had, had it, but as giving up your values, sacrifice. Well, if morality is all about sacrifice, and this is, this is the way that people think about it to this day, what, what does being moral mean? Self-sacrificially serving others. That's what people, bam, it's the first thing that comes to people's mind. Well, what does that have to do with making your life great? It's got nothing to do with it. They're totally different things. One is being a good person, giving up your values, and the other thing is pursuing your values and being selfish. There it is. So. This is why Ayn Rand's thinking on morality is so important. This is why she, she titled her book The Virtue of Selfishness. She wanted to get back to the Aristotelian idea that the whole point of ethics is to live a wonderful life. And she, she got more scientific than, than Aristotle did, uh, building on Aristotle, by the way, so you, this isn't a snub of him. But she, Aristotle had not grounded ethics fully in a scientific way, the way that Ayn Rand did, she discovered that the requirements of human life constitute the standard of moral value. And she has a whole uh, inductive uh, uh, um, discovery process of that, that that we can talk about another time. But once that's discovered, then once, the, once you know that the purpose of ethics is to guide us so that we can live wonderful lives, then we're back into the realm of science. It's just a matter of science, science and fact. What do you have to do to make that thing happen? It's a causal relationships, we're back in science. And this is what ethics proper, at least in my view, and certainly in Ayn Rand's view, this is what ethics proper is. But until you make that connection, the relationship of philosophy 
and what you do with your mind or what the nature of reality is or what you, in particular ethics, and ethics is really the centerpiece of, of all of philosophy because it's where the rubber meets the road. It's where, the, where you act. What are we supposed to do given all of the stuff we know or allegedly know? That's the, the moral realm. If that is bifurcated from making your life great, then there's the big split. And the only way to reconnect these things is to figure out whether you made a mistake. Maybe we're not supposed to live beautiful lives. Maybe we're just supposed to suffer and die. That's a possibility. Or maybe if we look at our nature and the nature of reality and the nature of other living things, we can discover that, you know what? The whole point of action and, ga and value pursuits is to live a wonderful life. And if that's the case, then these things can come back together. Then we can have this big integration. And I think this is the solution to the world's problem. I now sound like Miss America. I want to have world peace. And, but seriously, like if you make this big integration, and if other people make this big integration, then a whole lot of things start to change. People start to live differently. They get along better. This is, but there's a whole way that I individual rights links in with all of this, too, and, and, uh, and protection of rights and freedom and all of that. You probably can sense, sense from it where, where, where all of that is if you don't know already. But Ellen, to answer your question, the, 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 the problem has been that altruism, the idea that being moral consistent, self-sacrificing rather than self-gains and, 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 and self-development, um, that's, the, that's the split. And if you have that split, you can't do the rest of this. My question is about the knowledge action gap you mentioned in the last two steps. Yep. For some people, that's the place they get most stuck. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about what is going on with individuals when they simply don't flip that last switch. Yeah, great, great question. The knowledge action gap. Why is it that people just don't do the thing that they, you know you're supposed to do this stuff and it will make your life great, but you don't do it? I think there are several things involved, and it's very contextual, so different people do it for different things. Perfectionism can be a big problem. If, you're, if you feel like, I've got to make it perfect or I can't do it at all, it's going to stop you right there. And we, at OSI, we teach writing classes about, and we talk about the process of writing. And one of the things we talk about in the process of writing is that your first draft has a job. Your rough draft has a job. And its job is to suck. And if your rough draft doesn't suck, you did something wrong, right? <laughs> and the reason that we go through it, there's, that's one of the stages in the process is because you have to understand the purpose of each stage of a process so that you can let it do its thing. The editing phase is where you start to say, why does this suck? And you start to fix it. And that's a good thing to do too. But you can't do that if you don't have the draft. And you're not going to write a perfect draft because that's just not a thing in your first draft. It doesn't happen that way. So you've got to learn the process. Ed Catmull of Pixar talks about the way that they used to build, or not the way they used to, but the, the way that Pixar makes films. And he says, we get started on these things, and it's just a mess. Everything is a mess. And, but that's the way you have to start, because if, th there's no other way to start a big, complex process like that th other than to accept the mess and then work with the mess until it starts to become interesting and better and better. And so, so, so there's a process. So that's one thing that happens there. Um, the other, I'll give a solution. There are several other things that can happen. I actually think perfectionism is one big problem. Another problem is, is second-handedness. Oh, and second-handedness, by the way, can manifest either consciously, you're, like you're saying, I'm going to do what other people want me to do, or it can be a subconscious thing. You don't really realize that you're, you're just saying you're, you're putting too much weight on other people's opinions. And so it's not necessarily always, you know, mean that you're a bad person if you're doing that, but it's a problem for your life if you're doing that because it's, 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 it, it can really shut you down. So you want to pay attention to that. Are you, are you hesitating because you're worried about what other people are going to think about what you do? And to that, I say, just you know, g g give that idea the big finger and, and get away from it, right? Like, n no, I'm not going to worry about it. My life is mine. I'm going to make it beautiful. I'm going to take the actions that I need to do. And a solution, uh, one solution I have that, that works for both of those is I have this idea, and I'm going to be writing a piece on this, and it's called Your Best Friend You. And if you think about it, if a best friend comes to you and he goes, I know that I'm supposed to be doing these things, but I'm not doing them, right? And he tells you, lays out the problems. What would you say to him? You would sit down and you go, well, look, let's just talk. What is the first step that you would need to take here in order to get yourself out of this rut? What's one thing you can do? Let's go do that now, right? Or something like that. You'd give him some really good advice. It would be really sound advice. Treat yourself that way. 
or find a best friend and get them to, to help you with this. But treat your, talk to yourself the way that you would talk to a best friend if you were helping him or her through that kind of thing. Because it really is a problem. I've, I certainly have encountered it too. You know, you, you know you're supposed to do something, you're not doing it. It's like, Jesus, what is wrong with me? Don't I have free will? Can't I just say do it? Also, James Clear's advice on creating the environments that are conducive to or that incentivize the actions that you want to take, that's super important. Take carbs. You keep eating carbs. You're like, why do I keep eating these? I, I want to stop eating them. Well, you keep eating them because you keep buying them. Don't bring them into your house. If you don't bring them to your house, you can't eat them unless you go, you know. So, so that's another thing. And James Clear has a lot of really, really good advice on, on that kind of thing. But it, it's, it's a problem. Mel Gibson, uh, Mel Robin, Mel Gibson, Mel Robin's book, um, The Five Second Rule has a lot of research on what happens and why it happens if you literally just count backward from five, five, four, three, two, one, and then go, and then do the thing. So if you've got something you know you're supposed to do and you're not doing it, start count backwards, and on when you get to zero, go and do it. For some reason, it works. And she's got evidence about the, uh, 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 with some studies about that that are kind of interesting, they're worth looking into. Yes. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel. I'm from Ayn, Ayn Rand Center, Ukraine. Uh, so I have the question regarding selfishness, which actually uh, got me really puzzling. There is a really big philosopher like Jordan Peterson. He's really, you know, famous right now. And he has this uh, saw that you cannot be, you cannot act selfishness because there's different selves. So, for example, there is self of you right now. There is self of you of, in 10 years. There is self of you in like 50 years. And if you decide to do something, for example, you know, have money, um, you can, if you act from your selfishness from today point is one decision. If you act from like 20 years, you know, in future is other decision and like 50 years in the future is another decision. So I'm str I strongly disagree, but I don't have any arguments for that. So can you help me with that? Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, I think the problem with that kind of, of, of thinking is that it's just disintegrated. He, he's not he's not taking into account the actual nature of, of life and of, of being a human being and the actual nature of time. So in reality, the only reality is the one that's right here. There's only the now. This, by the way, is an interesting interconnection with our go what are what are our goals? They're actually abstractions. They're things that are in our mind. Your goals don't exist. I mean, you can write them down on paper and they exist in that sense or they exist in your mind. But they're abstractions. They're projections into the future. This is the thing I want to get to, I'm going to do. What's in the here and now is process, action. I hit that, say, that happened now, right? That, now it's gone. It's in the past, but it was there as it happened. But the only thing that's real is the here and now. And so that's what we're dealing with. However, we also know that, you know, calamities aside, we're going to live for a long time. Right. So if we use our capacity to project and if we if we use our capacity to lay out causal connections, we can paint a picture of where we want to go and what we want life to be. And we're not going to make it exactly like that. Right. You know, you, there are all these twists and turns and different things happen. But you can set a general direction and using reason and causal connections, you can move generally in that direction. So you can decide here's the me that's now. Here's the me that I'd like to have. Here are the changes that I'd like to make. And here are the steps that I can make to achieve those. But at any given time, there's only one you, and that's the one that actually exists right now. The abstraction is not real. And this is where Peterson gets, gets lost, I think, in these kinds of things. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not super read up on him. I find him hard to listen to because he sounds, he, he, he's, he's on one hand brilliant. On the other hand, he seems almost schizophrenic. Um, and almost like postmodern at times because he's, he, he's trying to connect things that, that don't, don't even connect. And then he also has this idea that, uh, that there are two different kinds of truth. There's metaphoric truth and then there's real truth. And I, I, all of that stuff just, just throws me into a tailspin. And I don't find any use value in it, so I don't keep reading it. I only, I only read stuff I find use value in. But the fact of the matter is that life is real. There's only one reality. It's this one that we live in. There's only one truth. It's your mind's correspondence to reality. And that's the truth that matters. And all of this metaphoric truth and biblical truth and this, that, and the other is just not real. It's, a, it's, it's they're abstractions and they're not real. The things that we need to guide our lives, or we need to know what kind of animal we are. We need to know the causal connections that enable us to achieve the values that will bring us eudaimonia, flourishing happiness, whatever it is that we want. And then we need to enact those, those things step by step. Will everything 
that you want the future to be happen? Of course not. Um, my, my life is is much much better, frankly, than 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 I would have projected it to be at, at various times in my life. So you know, it's not necessarily it's not, well. I'm not going to. It's not going to be as good as I project. It might be better than you project it. But the fact is, it's not going to be identical to your projection. But that's okay. That that's that's okay. So I think there's only one you, and that you consists of your mind and your body, your psychological elements, your your physical elements, and the integration of those. Sam Harris and company say there is no self. Well, who said that? <laughs> the, yourself is simply you. It's just your body and your mind and the integration of the two. Now, when if you die, then you're just a piece of you know deca decaying meat, and that's not you know you're not you're not you anymore. So because you're you're your mind is gone. And if you took your body away and could keep your, 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 just your soul, then you would be a ghost. And that, that wouldn't be a real thing either. So, um, so really, there is a you, and, and it's, and, but, but there's one. And you get to live for a fairly long time, if you, if you, you know, unless, unless some bad thing happens, obviously. But for the most part, we really do have the capacity to live beautiful lives, if we take it seriously. And so few people do. So, so many people live just sort of mundane or somewhere between mundane and pretty good. A lot of people live in that zone. If you want to live in the zone of my life is rocking, it's just you have to do this. You have to take it seriously. And, and thank goodness there's division of labor here. You've got people like, like Cal Newport and, and uh, McEwen and, and these other writers and thinkers. Um, Gretchen Rubin is another one who I have, think has some really, really good things to say. They are working tirelessly to develop and hone, hone and, and, and uh, perfect these theories that can help us do this thing. So I advise you to read, you know, read some of the best self-development literature and, and try to put it to use. Yeah. Hi, can you talk just a little bit more about uh, emotion? Um, we, you talked about how emotions are not tools of cognition or um, our means of knowledge, but when you're choosing your actions or prioritizing your values or you know, choosing those optional values like what's my career going to be, how do I choose my friends, uh, what I do for my hobbies, how do I pull on my emotions while still thinking rationally about those and using those two to come to kind of the best course of action for my life? Yeah, great question. So the, the role of emotions in trying to think about, um, and this is the last question, unfortunately, because I have, I have one minute, um, but guys who had questions, um, you can come up to me later and also take questions at my final lecture, which is going to be on a similar topic. Um, emotions. So the main thing to remember about emotions is that they are super important. They are super important, just like reason is super important. But they're different things. And one of the things I love about Ayn Rand's philosophy is that she recognizes this. And objectivism is basically 100% pro-emotion and 100% pro-reason. So you should do one thing specifically with each of these, and that is treat them as what they are all the time, right? Reason is your means of understanding reality, projecting causal connections, things like that. Emotions are automatic responses to your values, your, your preconceived values, the things you've already determined are value to you. Simplest way to think about this is if, if, if you have, if there's a, a, a ball game on and you've got a favorite team and they win, you feel elated, right? Why? Because your value and the action that happened co coincided and a good thing happens, so you, you, you feel elation. If they lose, you feel rotten. If you bet a lot of money on the game and they lose, you feel really rotten, right? <laughs> so, so your emotions do that. And what they are is they're your psychological means of experiencing your values. This is why they're so important. If we didn't have emotions, life wouldn't be worth living. You would, you would never get a rise out of anything or a fall out of anything. You'd just be like, uh, why? there's nothing there. So emotions are crucial because they enable us to experience our values in a psychological way. You, you experience your values in physical ways as well, but your emotions are the psychological means of doing that, the internal means. Um, but they're not your means of knowledge. So you just don't want to treat them as your means of knowledge. What you can do then when you're trying to think about what, what career do I want to do or is this a relationship good for me? How you feel about those things is extremely important. It's just not your means of knowledge. It's not your sole means of determining whether this is true. It's a fact that you feel this way about this person. It's a fact that you feel this way when you think about doing this career. That's a fact and because it's a fact, it should come into your thinking. That's what reason says. All the relevant facts matter to reason. So bring that into your reasoning. I love it when I, when I get up in the morning and I, and, I, and I can write a symphony rather than 
go dig a, dig a hole or whatever, right? So then this feeling, this is the thing that I would feel, that I would just feel alive doing. That's a really important fact. Then you have to ask things like, um, am I, is, can I do this as a career? Am I good enough? Do I have the potential here? If I felt really good about playing basketball and wanted to be a professional basketball player, it would be a bad choice anyway because I, I really don't have the, the capacity to do that. So you want to mix it with your capacity. Isaac Morehouse, a guy who's thinking I love, has a great way of thinking about careers. And he puts it in negative terms, but I think he does this because they're, they're, uh, he's dealing with a lot of young people who don't yet know what they want to do. So it's not like, well, I have this passion. It's like, I don't know what I want to do. So he says, there, there's a, a Venn diagram with three circles. Uh, stuff you don't hate, stuff you don't suck at, and stuff other people like or want, right? And if you find that midsection there, stuff you don't hate, yeah, this is okay, I could do this. Stuff that you're not, that you, that you have some skill in, and then other people want this thing, that circle right there is where you can find a sweet spot for a career. But notice, stuff you don't hate. There's emotion in there. Your emotions play a big role in this. But you only let them play the role that they, that they actually serve, which is that, that you know, they're, they're telling you how you feel about certain things, and, and that's an important fact. So I would put that in positive terms. You know, stuff you uh, either love to do or that you uh, dislike doing less than the other things that you might do. Stuff you're pretty good at and think you might want to get better at doing, because you can always learn. And then stuff that people will, will pay you for. There's your career. There's maybe a more positive way to think about that career sweet spot. But your emotions play a massive role. They just play a specific role, not the role of, of literally knowing what's true. Make sense? Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you.